English. First three. Now open your question paper and look at part one. You'll hear people talking in eight different situations. For questions one to eight, choose the best answer. A, B, or C. Question one. You hear a woman talking on the radio about an actor. Like many actors, he always seems to be in the news for one reason or another. I know celebrities can be given a tough time, but he seems to get off relatively lightly. He's in loads of movies these days, and so he should be. His performances were fairly patchy when he was starting out, in my opinion, but that's never the case these days. And the signs are he'll continue to develop, especially now he's getting to play lead roles in popular theatre productions too. If you ever get the chance to see him on stage, you won't be disappointed. Otherwise, catch him at a cinema near you. Like many actors, he always seems to be in the news for one reason or another. I know celebrities can be given a tough time, but he seems to get off relatively lightly. He's in loads of movies these days, and so he should be. His performances were fairly patchy when he was starting out, in my opinion, but that's never the case these days. And the signs are he'll continue to develop, especially now he's getting to play lead roles in popular theatre productions too. If you ever get the chance to see him on stage, you won't be disappointed. Otherwise, catch him at a cinema near you. Question 2. You hear a hairstylist talking about her career. You initially started off doing the hair of models in the fashion industry. What made you move to TV? The fashion industry turned me off quite a bit, actually. I didn't like working with people who had such a high opinion of themselves. My attitude is that you should treat everyone the same, and I found I was constantly having to bite my tongue because of the way I was treated there. The TV is different. It's much more a case of being respected for what you can offer regardless of your status, and that suits me. The TV people acknowledge you as a fellow professional, and they're much more down to earth. You initially started off doing the hair of models in the fashion industry. What made you move to TV? The fashion industry turned me off quite a bit, actually. I didn't like working with people who had such a high opinion of themselves. My attitude is that you should treat everyone the same, and I found I was constantly having to bite my tongue because of the way I was treated there. The TV is different. It's much more a case of being respected for what you can offer regardless of your status, and that suits me. The TV people acknowledge you as a fellow professional, and they're much more down to earth. Question 3. You hear a comedian called Jeff Knight talking on the radio about his profession. When I'm doing my comedy act at theatres or clubs or on TV, I'll often get my ideas from keeping my ears close to the ground. I try to pick up on all the strange and humorous everyday stuff, sometimes even boring, that you get in life, and I build it into my act. Obviously, I do also get ideas from listening to other comedians too. I like to think that three generations of one family can sit at my show and know they won't feel threatened because I'm not rude. Even in big arenas, people feel like I'm talking to them individually. It's a comfort thing for them. When I'm doing my comedy act at theatres or clubs or on TV, I'll often get my ideas from keeping my ears close to the ground. I try to pick up on all the strange and humorous everyday stuff, sometimes even boring, that you get in life, and I build it into my act. Obviously, I do also get ideas from listening to other comedians too. I like to think that three generations of one family can sit at my show and know they won't feel threatened because I'm not rude. Even in big arenas, people feel like I'm talking to them individually. 
It's a comfort thing for them. Question 4. You hear a conversation between a customer and a coffee shop employee. Excuse me, could someone come over and clear one of the tables in the window, please? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. We've just had a really busy lunch break, and between you and me, my colleague's new and hasn't really got the hang of things yet. Yes, you look as if you've been really busy. We should be able to get straight now. It's a bit quieter. I'll get my colleague to come and clear your table right away. Hmm, it certainly needs it. Anyway, what can I get you? Coffee and cake, or...? I'll just have coffee, please. And I'll get a cloth to wipe the table. Excuse me, could someone come over and clear one of the tables in the window, please? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. We've just had a really busy lunch break, and between you and me, my colleague's new and hasn't really got the hang of things yet. Yes, you look as if you've been really busy. We should be able to get straight now. It's a bit quieter. I'll get my colleague to come and clear your table right away. Hmm, it certainly needs it. Anyway, what can I get you? Coffee and cake, or...? I'll just have coffee, please. And I'll get a cloth to wipe the table. Question. Question 5. You hear a man telling a friend about an art exhibition. Hi, Mark. How did you like the exhibition? It was all right, actually. I've got the catalogue here. Would you like to have a look? I don't usually bother with them personally. They've always felt like a bit of a waste of money. I know what you mean. But somebody lent me this one. So, what's the gallery like? Really cool. Using natural light to show off the paintings saves energy, too, you know. I expect it was crowded. Well, I'd expected there to be masses of people, so I wouldn't be able to see anything. In fact, I nearly had the place to myself. Hi, Mark. How did you like the exhibition? It was all right, actually. I've got the catalogue here. Would you like to have a look? I don't usually bother with them personally. They've always felt like a bit of a waste of money. I know what you mean. But somebody lent me this one. So, what's the gallery like? Really cool. Using natural light to show off the paintings saves energy, too, you know. I expect it was crowded. Well, I'd expected there to be masses of people, so I wouldn't be able to see anything. In fact, I nearly had the place to myself. Question 6. You overhear a man ringing a sports shop. Hello, Colin Fogarty here. I was in the shop last week and bought a pair of the new Comfort football boots. I asked about a discount I'd heard about from members of Kirkley Rangers Football Club, which I'm a member of. The assistant was by herself and said she didn't know anything about it. I then checked on the football club website and it confirms what I thought. I emailed you at the shop this morning and was told that the shop gives special discounts for official club purchases, but I'm still not sure whether the discount is applicable to ordinary club members like me, so I thought I'd better ring and sort it all out. Hello, Colin Fogarty here. I was in the shop last week and bought a pair of the new Comfort football boots. I asked about a discount I'd heard about from members of Kirkley Rangers Football Club, which I'm a member of. The assistant was by herself and said she didn't know anything about it. I then checked on the football club website and it confirms what I thought. I emailed you at the shop this morning and was told that the shop gives special discounts for official club purchases, but I'm still not sure whether the discount is applicable to ordinary club members like me, so I thought I'd better ring and sort it all out. Question 7. You hear a man telling a friend about his work. So you've been at the company for five years. How do you feel it's going? Well, the boss sees me as someone who'll go far, but I don't really know if I want to. I mean, I've seen what happened to Joe, who was promoted last year to sales manager. At the time, I thought, lucky him, but he isn't enjoying it. 
The working environment isn't as friendly and supportive as it was when I first joined, mainly because of all the targets we've been set. Sad that management feels the need to play with what was a winning formula. Still, let's see what the future brings. So you've been at the company for five years. How do you feel it's going? Well, the boss sees me as someone who'll go far, but I don't really know if I want to. I mean, I've seen what happened to Joe, who was promoted last year to sales manager. At the time, I thought, lucky him, but he isn't enjoying it. The working environment isn't as friendly and supportive as it was when I first joined, mainly because of all the targets we've been set. Sad that management feels the need to play with what was a winning formula. Still, let's see what the future brings. Question 8. You hear two people talking about a country walk they're doing. Are you feeling tired? No, I'm fine. Just stopping to look at the scenery. It's beautiful, isn't it? Fabulous. But keep moving. It's too cold to stand still. Well, we knew that when we set off. The forecast's better for tomorrow. I did say we should wait. Sorry, I know, but let's carry on because there's only another five kilometres to go. Right or left here? Mm, left, I think, according to the map. Five kilometres, you said? It'll be just about dark when we get to the end. If we do get there. <laughs> I'm only joking. Are you feeling tired? No, I'm fine. Just stopping to look at the scenery. It's beautiful, isn't it? Fabulous. But keep moving. It's too cold to stand still. Well, we knew that when we set off. The forecast's better for tomorrow. I did say we should wait. Sorry, I know. But let's carry on because there's only another five kilometres to go. Right or left here? Mm, left, I think, according to the map. Five kilometres, you said? It'll be just about dark when we get to the end. If we do get there, <laughs> I'm only joking. That's the end of part one. Now turn to part two. You'll hear a presentation given by a university student called Megan Rowlings about a forest survival course she went on in Australia. For questions 9 to 18, complete the sentences with a word or short phrase. You now have 45 seconds to look at part 2. Hi! My name's Megan, and I'm going to tell you about a forest survival course in Australia. So, how did I come to do a course like that? Well, I've been thinking about what to do in my summer holiday, and my professor suggested I should do some teaching at a summer camp he was running, but I wanted to get away from academic stuff for a while. Then, my father found the website about survival courses while looking for something to interest my brother, and that was it. The course leader, John, was a very experienced survival expert with an impressive range of skills. I can't tell you how absolutely terrifying the experience of being in the forest was at times, but John's humour eased the tension, for which I was really grateful. He also knew exactly when to offer support and when to leave us to it. Chris was his assistant, and he brought different qualities to the group. He was never short of enthusiasm and was particularly keen on insects. He told us the name of every one we came across in the forest. He also knew all the facts about plants, so that over the five days we got to know what was safe to eat while we were there and what we had to avoid. That information proved really valuable. There were ten of us on the course and we made a great team. I thought I'd struggle with the tasks that made big physical demands because of my size, but I soon learnt that mental toughness was equally important. And in fact, that turned out to be something I didn't have a problem with. John drilled into us the importance of staying safe at all times. In that respect, possessing sufficient self-awareness is key. 
Knowing our own capabilities and limitations could save our lives. All this holds back panic, which is often a greater danger than the situations we find ourselves in. We'd all been equipped with a mini survival kit, which contained things like a first aid kit and water sterilization tablets, and of course we'd all brought other things as well, including some fancy gadgets which were never used. <laughs> But nobody else had thought about plastic bags to keep stuff dry in our rucksacks. I passed mine around and they were much appreciated. <laughs> our first task was to make tools that we could use. For example, did you know you can actually make a spear from a branch if it's strong enough? We were shown how to make a knife out of a stone that was lying on the forest floor. It took me quite a long time to make one, but it was great for all sorts of tasks. <laughs> The next thing was to find a water source. We found a small stream and we followed that some distance to where it finally joined a river. John told us that because the water at that point was quite fast flowing, it was drinkable as long as we boiled it. There was also a small lake nearby, but we were advised not to use that because of the wild animals that were often there. Our first meal in the forest was what we collected ourselves, such as berries. Then, after all that walking and looking for food, we were ready for a good night's sleep. I didn't find making a shelter too problematic, actually, which was just as well, because if lighting a fire without matches had been left to me, then we'd have been shivering all night. <laughs> the thing that I found most interesting about the course was that many of the skills I use as a student at university are invaluable for survival too. Of course, you'd expect team building to be useful, but what I hadn't expected was that being good at time management would also be an advantage. Now you'll hear part two again. Hi, my name's Megan and I'm going to tell you about a forest survival course in Australia. So, how did I come to do a course like that? Well, I'd been thinking about what to do in my summer holiday, and my professor suggested I should do some teaching at a summer camp he was running, but I wanted to get away from academic stuff for a while. Then my father found the website about survival courses while looking for something to interest my brother, and that was it. The course leader, John, was a very experienced survival expert with an impressive range of skills. I can't tell you how absolutely terrifying the experience of being in the forest was at times, but John's humour eased the tension, for which I was really grateful. He also knew exactly when to offer support and when to leave us to it. Chris was his assistant, and he brought different qualities to the group. He was never short of enthusiasm and was particularly keen on insects. He told us the name of every one we came across in the forest. He also knew all the facts about plants, so that over the five days we got to know what was safe to eat while we were there and what we had to avoid. That information proved really valuable. There were ten of us on the course and we made a great team. I thought I'd struggle with the tasks that made big physical demands because of my size, but I soon learnt that mental toughness was equally important. And in fact, that turned out to be something I didn't have a problem with. John drilled into us the importance of staying safe at all times. In that respect, possessing sufficient self-awareness is key. Knowing our own capabilities and limitations could save our lives. All this holds back panic, which is often a greater danger than the situations we find ourselves in. We'd all been equipped with a mini survival kit, which contained things like a first aid kit and water sterilization tablets, and of course we'd all brought other things as well, including some fancy gadgets which were never used. But nobody else had thought about plastic bags to keep stuff dry in our rucksacks. I passed mine around and they were much appreciated. <laughs> our first task was to make tools that we could use. For example, did you know you can actually make a spear from a branch if it's strong enough? We were shown how to make a knife out of a stone that was lying on the forest floor. It took me quite a long time to make one, but it was great for all sorts of tasks. The next thing was to find a water source. 
We found a small stream and we followed that some distance to where it finally joined a river. John told us that because the water at that point was quite fast flowing, it was drinkable as long as we boiled it. There was also a small lake nearby, but we were advised not to use that because of the wild animals that were often there. Our first meal in the forest was what we collected ourselves, such as berries. Then, after all that walking and looking for food, we were ready for a good night's sleep. I didn't find making a shelter too problematic, actually, which was just as well, because if lighting a fire without matches had been left to me, then we'd have been shivering all night. <laughs> The thing that I found most interesting about the course was that many of the skills I use as a student at university are invaluable for survival too. Of course, you'd expect team building to be useful. But what I hadn't expected was that being good at time management would also be an advantage. That's the end of part two. Now turn to part three. You'll hear five short extracts, in which people talk about a problem they had in their first few weeks in a new job. For questions 19 to 23, choose what problem, A to H, each speaker says they had. Use the letters only once. There are three extra letters which you do not need to use. You now have 30 seconds to look at part three. Speaker one. Well, I work for an IT company and I love it because it's really stimulating. I work hard, but the rewards are there. At the same time, it's quite laid back, at least where the dress code is concerned anyway. My first few weeks were great. My friend works in the adjoining building, so we often had lunch together. The problem was she had a longer lunch break than me, and I started wandering back a few minutes over the hour. I didn't think anyone would notice, but my colleagues soon had a quiet word with me, in the nicest possible way, of course. I don't do that anymore. Speaker 2 My first job was for a finance company. I'd beaten off quite a few candidates to get the job, and I was riding high. I'd bought a new suit and briefcase, and walked in there on the first day thinking, this is it. Now I'm going to show them what I'm made of. I thought I knew it all. I'd correct colleagues if they said something wrong, and I was always talking about what I'd learnt at university. Anyway, in my fourth week, the boss called me in and told me I'd done something that had lost the company quite a lot of money. I learnt a lot that day. Speaker 3 I worked for a small company locally. It was my first job back after maternity leave, and I was really glad to be back at work. I got on well with my colleagues, and the work was fine, but I really didn't like the boss. Anyway, I got quite friendly in the first few weeks with the receptionist. She was a nice young girl, very chatty. She asked me how I was getting on, and I said I really liked the job and everything, but not the boss. Stupid, I know. Anyway, it turns out that the receptionist was the boss's niece. <laughs> Small world. I should have noticed their surnames were the same. Speaker 4 Well, I didn't really need the job in the supermarket. You know, I was retired and just wanted something to fill the time. Well, and the extra money was useful. I'd been a manager for an engineering company in the past, so I knew how things worked. I did my job, I was always on time, but I resented being told to do things that weren't in my job description, and I didn't think that was fair. I didn't say anything, but I think they knew I wasn't happy. In the end, I decided I didn't fit in. On reflection, I think retirement suits me better. Speaker 5 I've never been very confident, so I was really surprised when I was offered a job in a very posh law company. I decided to really show them that I was up to doing the job, but I went a bit too far, volunteering to do everything, taking clients' names and details home to memorise so I could greet them by name when they came in and so on. 
I overdid it, actually, because I wasn't being myself. After a few weeks, my colleagues told me to relax and that I was doing fine as I was. I didn't need to prove anything. I love my job now. Now you'll hear part three again. Speaker one. Well, I work for an IT company, and I love it because it's really stimulating. I work hard, but the rewards are there. At the same time, it's quite laid back, at least where the dress code is concerned anyway. My first few weeks were great. My friend works in the adjoining building, so we often had lunch together. The problem was she had a longer lunch break than me, and I started wandering back a few minutes over the hour. I didn't think anyone would notice, but my colleagues soon had a quiet word with me, in the nicest possible way, of course. I don't do that anymore. Speaker 2 My first job was for a finance company. I'd beaten off quite a few candidates to get the job, and I was riding high. I bought a new suit and briefcase and walked in there on the first day thinking, this is it. Now I'm going to show them what I'm made of. I thought I knew it all. I'd correct colleagues if they said something wrong, and I was always talking about what I'd learnt at university. Anyway, in my fourth week, the boss called me in and told me I'd done something that had lost the company quite a lot of money. I learnt a lot that day. Speaker 3 I worked for a small company locally. It was my first job back after maternity leave, and I was really glad to be back at work. I got on well with my colleagues, and the work was fine, but I really didn't like the boss. Anyway, I got quite friendly in the first few weeks with the receptionist. She was a nice young girl, very chatty. She asked me how I was getting on, and I said I really liked the job and everything, but not the boss. Stupid, I know. Anyway, it turns out that the receptionist was the boss's niece. <laughs> Small world. I should have noticed their surnames were the same. Speaker 4 Well, I didn't really need the job in the supermarket. You know, I was retired and just wanted something to fill the time. Well, and the extra money was useful. I'd been a manager for an engineering company in the past, so I knew how things worked. I did my job, I was always on time, but I resented being told to do things that weren't in my job description and I didn't think that was fair. I didn't say anything, but I think they knew I wasn't happy. In the end, I decided I didn't fit in. On reflection, I think retirement suits me better. Speaker 5 I've never been very confident, so I was really surprised when I was offered a job in a very posh law company. I decided to really show them that I was up to doing the job, but I went a bit too far, volunteering to do everything, taking clients' names and details home to memorise so I could greet them by name when they came in and so on. I overdid it, actually, because I wasn't being myself. After a few weeks, my colleagues told me to relax and that I was doing fine as I was. I didn't need to prove anything. I love my job now. That's the end of part three. Now turn to part four. You'll hear an interview with an international concert pianist called Karen Hong. For questions 24 to 30, choose the best answer. A, B, or C. You now have one minute to look at part four. My guest today is the international concert pianist Karen Hong. Welcome, Karen. I'm sure you're busy with your piano practice. Don't apologize, but you're right. I do an average of six hours practice a day. People think when you're a performer, you just know the pieces of music by heart and don't need to practice, but this isn't true. For one thing, you might be performing a piece for the first time. For another, even pieces you know well still need maintenance and repair work on them. 
Also, every pianist at whatever level needs to do their drills and finger exercises as a warm-up. I remember you saying before that your parents are both very dynamic, motivated people. Yes, absolutely. My mother would repeat to me, you have this opportunity to develop your talent. Neither your father nor I had this. Don't waste it. She made me do three hours practice a day, even before I was allowed out with my friends. She's never cared about the fame or fortune aspect of my career. To this day, she'll still tell me if she thinks I haven't done enough practice before a concert. Dad's different. He can't hide his delight at my success. You won a major competition for young musicians, and for a couple of years you seem to be forever in the limelight. I got numerous offers to do advertising, even modeling. When you're thrown into all that, it's really easy to become disorientated and forget what brought you to everyone's attention in the first place. I reached a point where I didn't believe all the hype about me. I kept asking myself what my celebrity was really based on. I was doing more than 100 concerts a year, so I didn't have nearly enough time to rehearse properly. I'd walk onto a stage and feel I was insulting my own ability. So you decided to take some time off, I believe? Yes. I felt some of the support I needed wasn't necessarily there within the profession. It's an extremely cutthroat business, so I guess it's understandable. So yes, I turned my back on that world for two months, gave no performances. I changed my agent, I found two new teachers in China, and I made sure I got back to practicing with other pianists as opposed to by myself. At that time, when you were performing a lot on TV, the media seemed to be using you to glamorize classical music. Yes, the marketing people tried to project me as a popular classical babe. You know, trying to make classical music more youthful and appealing. And while I rejected all the glamour side of that, the purely musical aspect of it did still appeal to me. I love the idea of building a bridge between two worlds. I've played Bach at a televised rock concert in Russia. As long as I can play a piece of music that I think is good, I'm up for playing it anywhere. So, what do you feel about pop music? I don't really have strong opinions about it. I just think it's a pity that in some countries there's this commercial culture attached to it that is drummed into kids' brains every day, and that this makes them see classical music as elitist and remote, when subsequently they get to be teenagers. But to a five-year-old child, say, music is music. It just sounds how it should. They don't have any preconceptions about it. I understand you've done a lot of work with young schoolchildren. Yes. Classical music can really help children to become happy, creative people. But when I go into schools, I don't just say nice, encouraging things to the children, the musicians, when they don't deserve it. I went into one school regularly to help out with music lessons, and after a while I really started to emphasize to them the value of hard work. As a result, the school now has nine of its students playing with the National Youth Orchestra. Now you'll hear part four again. My guest today is the international concert pianist Karen Hong. Welcome, Karen. I'm sure you're busy with your piano practice. Don't apologize, but you're right. I do an average of six hours practice a day. People think when you're a performer, you just know the pieces of music by heart and don't need to practice, but this isn't true. For one thing, you might be performing a piece for the first time. For another, even pieces you know well still need maintenance and repair work on them. Also, every pianist at whatever level needs to do their drills and finger exercises as a warm-up. I remember you saying before that your parents are both very dynamic, motivated people. Yes, absolutely. My mother would repeat to me, you have this opportunity to develop your talent. Neither your father nor I had this. Don't waste it. She made me do three hours practice a day, even before I was allowed out with my friends. She's never cared about the fame or fortune aspect of my career. To this day, she'll still tell me if she thinks I haven't done enough practice before a concert. 
Dad's different. He can't hide his delight at my success. You won a major competition for young musicians, and for a couple of years you seem to be forever in the limelight. I got numerous offers to do advertising, even modeling. When you're thrown into all that, it's really easy to become disorientated and forget what brought you to everyone's attention in the first place. I reached a point where I didn't believe all the hype about me. I kept asking myself what my celebrity was really based on. I was doing more than 100 concerts a year, so I didn't have nearly enough time to rehearse properly. I'd walk onto a stage and feel I was insulting my own ability. So you decided to take some time off, I believe? Yes. I felt some of the support I needed wasn't necessarily there within the profession. It's an extremely cutthroat business, so I guess it's understandable. So yes, I turned my back on that world for two months, gave no performances. I changed my agent, I found two new teachers in China, and I made sure I got back to practicing with other pianists as opposed to by myself. At that time, when you were performing a lot on TV, the media seemed to be using you to glamorize classical music. Yes, the marketing people tried to project me as a popular classical babe, you know, trying to make classical music more youthful and appealing. And while I rejected all the glamour side of that, the purely musical aspect of it did still appeal to me. I love the idea of building a bridge between two worlds. I've played Bach at a televised rock concert in Russia. As long as I can play a piece of music that I think is good, I'm up for playing it anywhere. So, what do you feel about pop music? I don't really have strong opinions about it. I just think it's a pity that in some countries there's this commercial culture attached to it that is drummed into kids' brains every day, and that this makes them see classical music as elitist and remote, when subsequently they get to be teenagers. But to a five-year-old child, say, music is music. It just sounds how it should. They don't have any preconceptions about it. I understand you've done a lot of work with young schoolchildren. Yes. Classical music can really help children to become happy, creative people. But when I go into schools, I don't just say nice, encouraging things to the children, the musicians, when they don't deserve it. I went into one school regularly to help out with music lessons, and after a while, I really started to emphasize to them the value of hard work. As a result, the school now has nine of its students playing with the National Youth Orchestra. That's the end of part four. There will now be a pause of five minutes for you to copy your answers onto the separate answer sheet. Be sure to follow the numbering of all the questions. I'll remind you when there is one minute left so that you are sure to finish in time. Cambridge English, first three, 
Now open your question paper and look at part one. You'll hear people talking in eight different situations. For questions one to eight, choose the best answer. A, B, or C. Question one. You hear a man talking about collecting old coins. My dad used to collect rare old coins, and when I was younger, I thought that was a really weird thing to do. But as I've got older, I can see the attraction. Someone once bought a loaf of bread or some cheese with those coins, and for me, that's brilliant. I don't buy online much because you never know what you're getting, and there are a lot of fakes out there. I go to a specialist coin shop and chat to the guys there. They know everything there is to know about coins. I've got a few gaps in my collection, but that's fine. I'm not one for perfection. My dad used to collect rare old coins, and when I was younger, I thought that was a really weird thing to do. But as I've got older, I can see the attraction. Someone once bought a loaf of bread or some cheese with those coins, and for me, that's brilliant. I don't buy online much because you never know what you're getting, and there are a lot of fakes out there. I go to a specialist coin shop. And chat to the guys there. They know everything there is to know about coins. I've got a few gaps in my collection, but that's fine. I'm not one for perfection. Question two: You hear a woman talking about playing the piano. People ask me about playing the piano and if it's a difficult instrument to learn, and the answer is yes and no. At the beginning, anyone can make a sound on the piano just by pressing a single note, and it sounds pretty good. The equivalent could not be said about learning the violin, however. But to progress further, you have to have patience and some musical ability. It's best to learn from someone who knows and is good at teaching the technique needed. And obviously, there's no escaping from the fact that you have to practice every day without fail. That way, you'll come on quite quickly. People ask me about playing the piano and if it's a difficult instrument to learn, and the answer is yes and no. At the beginning, anyone can make a sound on the piano just by pressing a single note, and it sounds pretty good. The equivalent could not be said about learning the violin, however. But to progress further, you have to have patience and some musical ability. It's best to learn from someone who knows and is good at teaching the technique needed. And obviously, there's no escaping from the fact that you have to practice every day without fail. That way, you'll come on quite quickly. Question three: You overhear a man and a woman. Talking in an art gallery about a boy's paintings. It's hard to believe the artist's only seven years old. Look at the perspective in this one. He's got it just right. It takes art students years to master that. A child couldn't have painted these. I reckon it's all a fake. The gallery's passing off the paintings of someone much older as the work of a child to trick people into buying. I mean, the way he's got the effect of the light on the water—that's the work of a much more experienced artist. I saw a TV program about him. He really does do them himself, and people must think they're worth the price. They're sold out. It's hard to believe the artist's only seven years old. Look at the perspective in this one. He's got it just right. It takes art students years to master that. A child couldn't have painted these. I reckon it's all a fake. The gallery's passing off the paintings of someone much older as the work of a child to trick people into buying. I mean, the way he's got the effect of the light on the water—that's the work of a much more experienced artist. I saw a TV program about him. He really does do them himself. And people must think they're worth the price. They're sold out. Question four: You hear two students talking about a university chemistry lecturer.
Hi, Mike. That was another good chemistry lecture by Jane Wilson, wasn't it? Yeah, I like her. I can't always follow what she's saying, though. Oh, I think she makes complicated ideas easier to understand. And she's so good at communicating her own excitement about chemistry. We all end up sharing it. There's no denying that. And she's OK about things like getting work in a few days after a deadline, which is nice. That hasn't been everyone's experience, I must say. But then I can see why, really. Her schedule's so packed, I'm amazed she has time to do all she does. Yeah, that's true. Hi, Mike. That was another good chemistry lecture by Jane Wilson, wasn't it? Yeah, I like her. I can't always follow what she's saying, though. Oh, I think she makes complicated ideas easier to understand. And she's so good at communicating her own excitement about chemistry. We all end up sharing it. There's no denying that. And she's OK about things like getting work in a few days after a deadline, which is nice. That hasn't been everyone's experience, I must say. But then I can see why, really. Her schedule's so packed, I'm amazed she has time to do all she does. Yeah, that's true. Question 5. You hear a woman talking to a work colleague about moving abroad for a new job. Two years living away is a long time. Yes, but I don't have to worry about whether I can return to my old position. That's guaranteed. Anyway, I'm 24 now and opportunities like this aren't common. Especially to oversee new project developments. Yes. I mean, I was doing that already, in a way, so I'm not sure I can think of it as a promotion. The only thing is, I tried to negotiate a delay to the contract so I'd have a bit more time to get myself together, but it couldn't be done. I felt I didn't have any say in the matter. Oh well, don't let that get in the way. Two years living away is a long time. Yes, but I don't have to worry about whether I can return to my old position. That's guaranteed. Anyway, I'm 24 now and opportunities like this aren't common. Especially to oversee new project developments. Yes. I mean, I was doing that already, in a way, so I'm not sure I can think of it as a promotion. The only thing is, I tried to negotiate a delay to the contract so I'd have a bit more time to get myself together, but it couldn't be done. I felt I didn't have any say in the matter. Oh well, don't let that get in the way. Question 6. You hear two friends talking about a job interview. Hi Noel. how did the job interview go? Quite well actually, though I knew it would be alright. Really? Well, yeah. I mean, I'm usually nervous about job interviews, and there were three of them asking me questions. But this time, I felt very well prepared, and I've got the right kind of experience for the job, so that gave me confidence, I suppose. Were there any questions you couldn't answer? Not really, though some were pretty hard. Luckily, I'd done plenty of research beforehand. Clearly, they hadn't expected me to be able to answer them all, so that was good. Well, I hope you get it. Thanks. Hi, Noel. How did the job interview go? Quite well, actually, though I knew it would be all right. Really? Well, yeah. I mean, I'm usually nervous about job interviews, and there were three of them asking me questions. But this time, I felt very well prepared, and I've got the right kind of experience for the job, so that gave me confidence, I suppose. Were there any questions you couldn't answer? Not really, though some were pretty hard. Luckily, I'd done plenty of research beforehand. Clearly, they hadn't expected me to be able to answer them all, so that was good. Well, I hope you get it. Thanks. Quest Question 7. You hear part of a radio programme. I think lots of people will be interested in finding out more about it. It's a great way of seeing all the plants and trees that thrive in this area, and in spring it's spectacular. Teachers who want to encourage their students to protect the environment should take them. After all, there's nothing like experiencing something for yourself to make you value it. 
We've made sure it's as accessible as possible and hope it'll be popular with people of all ages. If you want more information, the details are all online. There's no excuse not to get out there and try it. I think lots of people will be interested in finding out more about it. It's a great way of seeing all the plants and trees that thrive in this area, and in spring it's spectacular. Teachers who want to encourage their students to protect the environment should take them. After all, there's nothing like experiencing something for yourself to make you value it. We've made sure it's as accessible as possible and hope it'll be popular with people of all ages. If you want more information, the details are all online. There's no excuse not to get out there and try it. Question 8. You hear a woman talking to her brother about his hair. It doesn't look too bad, actually. You're joking. No way. I mean it. I think you should have taken a lot more off, especially at the front. Well, maybe you should get a hairdresser to do it instead. Though, I think I did pretty well, really. Don't you think you're overreacting a bit? I don't want all my friends to laugh at me. They won't. Anyway, you shouldn't have it cut too often, even by me. It suits you like this. And it'll look even better in a couple of weeks. Well, I suppose I should trust you. Of course you should. I'm your sister. It doesn't look too bad, actually. You're joking. No way. I mean it. I think you should have taken a lot more off, especially at the front. Well, maybe you should get a hairdresser to do it instead. Though, I think I did pretty well, really. Don't you think you're overreacting a bit? I don't want all my friends to laugh at me. They won't. Anyway, you shouldn't have it cut too often, even by me. It suits you like this. And it'll look even better in a couple of weeks. Well, I suppose I should trust you. Of course you should. I'm your sister. That's the end of part one. Now turn to part two. You'll hear a man called David Briggs giving a talk about his work as a volunteer on a turtle conservation program in Western Australia. For questions 9 to 18, complete the sentences with a word or short phrase. You now have 45 seconds to look at part 2. I want to tell you about my work as a volunteer on a turtle conservation program this summer in Western Australia. I'd been looking through various websites with my mother, trying, rather unsuccessfully, to find something interesting to do before I went to university, when my uncle rang me and told me about this turtle tagging program. Basically, they were asking for people to help with the actual tagging, you know, attaching electronic tags to the turtles so that scientists can collect vital data about them. So I emailed them and got all the information. There was a choice of sites we could work at, the mainland one or the one on an island miles out into the ocean. I didn't want to be stuck right out there, so my choice was easy. They wanted people who preferably had prior experience of working on conservation projects, which I hadn't, or who were keen on marine science, and that was what I was going to study at university, so that helped me get a place on the programme. I was warned that the work would be very physical. In fact, we all had to attend a medical assessment to check whether we were fit enough for the work, and there were tests to show our ability to run over longish distances, not my favourite occupation, and also whether we had the strength to lift heavy objects, Curiously, we weren't asked if we could swim, which I really thought would have been important, but I was told that most of the work took place on the beach. The conditions offered were pretty good. Accommodation was provided, and, of course, training, which just left me with having to pay for transport. I did think we might have to pay for food, but nope, all included. 
My mother provided me with lots of chocolate, as that's one luxury she knows I can't live without. Of course, as volunteers, we weren't paid for the work, but that didn't really worry me. When I got out there, I soon realised why physical fitness was important. My team had to do beach patrols at night. The female turtles come out of the ocean and onto the beach to nest then. Other volunteers worked different shifts doing other stuff in the daytime. Our patrols had to identify, tag, measure and collect data on all the turtles that were there. So you had to know what you were doing and do it fast. But what really mattered to me was to be gentle so as not to distress the turtles. Each shift lasted for about eight hours and that might include walking up to 15 kilometres on soft sand. And on top of all that, we were operating in conditions of high humidity. I didn't enjoy the humidity, but I liked the heat. The same couldn't be said for my mates on the programme, who found that hard to cope with, but we were all glad to get back to our air-conditioned huts after our shifts. Sometimes, when you were tired in the middle of a shift, it was a challenge to maintain concentration, but our commitment to the project was total, so our enthusiasm never seemed to flag. The scientists used the data we collected to monitor turtle behaviour, including breeding, feeding and migration patterns. I had a good laugh with all the other volunteers when we weren't working. They were all young, but not all filling in time between school and university like me. Some were unemployed. Most of them were returners, some for the sixth time. I learnt a lot about turtles and conservation issues from them. I'd consider doing it again, as I thought it was a really worthwhile programme. Now you'll hear part two again. I want to tell you about my work as a volunteer on a turtle conservation program this summer in Western Australia. I'd been looking through various websites with my mother, trying, rather unsuccessfully, to find something interesting to do before I went to university, when my uncle rang me and told me about this turtle tagging program. Basically, they were asking for people to help with the actual tagging, you know, attaching electronic tags to the turtles so that scientists can collect vital data about them. So I emailed them and got all the information. There was a choice of sites we could work at, the mainland one or the one on an island miles out into the ocean. I didn't want to be stuck right out there, so my choice was easy. They wanted people who preferably had prior experience of working on conservation projects, which I hadn't, or who were keen on marine science, and that was what I was going to study at university, so that helped me get a place on the programme. I was warned that the work would be very physical. In fact, we all had to attend a medical assessment to check whether we were fit enough for the work. And there were tests to show our ability to run over longish distances. Not my favourite occupation. And also whether we had the strength to lift heavy objects. Curiously, we weren't asked if we could swim, which I really thought would have been important, but I was told that most of the work took place on the beach. The conditions offered were pretty good. Accommodation was provided, and, of course, training, which just left me with having to pay for transport. I did think we might have to pay for food, but nope, all included. My mother provided me with lots of chocolate, as that's one luxury she knows I can't live without. Of course, as volunteers, we weren't paid for the work, but that didn't really worry me. When I got out there... I soon realised why physical fitness was important. My team had to do beach patrols at night. The female turtles come out of the ocean and onto the beach to nest then. Other volunteers worked different shifts doing other stuff in the daytime. Our patrols had to identify, tag, measure and collect data on all the turtles that were there. So you had to know what you were doing and do it fast. But what really mattered to me was to be gentle so as not to distress the turtles. Each shift lasted for about eight hours, and that might include walking up to 15 kilometres on soft sand. And on top of all that, we were operating in conditions of high humidity. I didn't enjoy the humidity, but I liked the heat. 
The same couldn't be said for my mates on the programme, who found that hard to cope with, but we were all glad to get back to our air-conditioned huts after our shifts. Sometimes, when you were tired in the middle of a shift, it was a challenge to maintain concentration, but our commitment to the project was total, so our enthusiasm never seemed to flag. The scientists used the data we collected to monitor turtle behaviour, including breeding, feeding and migration patterns. I had a good laugh with all the other volunteers when we weren't working. They were all young, but not all filling in time between school and university like me. Some were unemployed. Most of them were returners, some for the sixth time. I learnt a lot about turtles and conservation issues from them. I'd consider doing it again, as I thought it was a really worthwhile programme. That's the end of part two. Now turn to part three. You'll hear five short extracts, in which writers give advice about writing comedy scripts for television. For questions 19 to 23, choose which piece of advice, A to H, each speaker gives. Use the letters only once. There are three extra letters which you do not need to use. You now have 30 seconds to look at part three. Speaker 1 You have to be brutal with yourself. By that I mean you must look carefully at what you've written and cut about half of it. Being brief and to the point is the key to writing good comedy. And listen to the rhythm of a sentence, how a joke sounds. Just removing one word or changing its position can have a great effect. But a comedy show is more than just a series of jokes. In the best comic scenes, the humor lies in the people and how they react to their situation. So take trouble when you're creating them. Speaker 2 If you show viewers what they're supposed to find funny about the situation from the beginning, they have longer to enjoy it. For example, you'll get a lot of laughs if they can say straight away, Oh, I see, it's a clown who doesn't like children. Or, Oh, I get it, it's a surgeon who can't stand the sight of blood. And don't feel you have to explain everything in great detail. That soon gets boring. Read your script to someone with an underdeveloped sense of humour, and when they start looking sleepy, you know you should cut huge chunks. Speaker 3 you have to be able to accept criticism, take on board all the negative comments you get about your work and use them to improve it. I suppose it's fine if you're a brilliant writer. Brilliant writers can refuse to alter their artistic vision in any way. But if, like me, you're far from being brilliant, then you need help and advice from anyone who can be bothered to give it. Not all advice is helpful, though. People often instruct young comics, write about what makes you laugh. But you won't sell many scripts if the only one to find them funny is you. Speaker 4 Doing any kind of writing is lonely, and comedy is no different. Finding a writing partner is great. My best days are spent sitting in a room with someone else and trying to make each other laugh. You might then have to go off and work stuff up on your own, but at least you know one person has found your jokes funny. Oh, and move around a lot. It does wonders for your concentration. I've solved many problems walking to and from the fridge in search of a snack. Pausing to do a household chore, like washing up, works for other people. Speaker 5 The best advice I was ever given was to immerse myself in the kind of scripts that really made me laugh and to analyse how it worked. Now, I'm not telling you to copy it, but I am saying you should use it as inspiration. Then send an example of your best material to the creators of shows you admire. 
Tell them what you admire about their work, and just keep on writing whatever happens. At first you might think you're mostly producing rubbish, but gradually there'll be less rubbish and more gold, so don't give up. Now you'll hear part three again. Speaker one. You have to be brutal with yourself. By that, I mean, you must look carefully at what you've written and cut about half of it. Being brief and to the point is the key to writing good comedy. And listen to the rhythm of a sentence, how a joke sounds. Just removing one word or changing its position can have a great effect. But a comedy show is more than just a series of jokes. In the best comic scenes, the humor lies in the people and how they react to their situation. So take trouble when you're creating them. Speaker 2 If you show viewers what they're supposed to find funny about the situation from the beginning, they have longer to enjoy it. For example, you'll get a lot of laughs if they can say straight away, Oh, I see, it's a clown who doesn't like children. Or, Oh, I get it, it's a surgeon who can't stand the sight of blood. And don't feel you have to explain everything in great detail. That soon gets boring. Read your script to someone with an underdeveloped sense of humour, and when they start looking sleepy, you know you should cut huge chunks. Speaker 3 you have to be able to accept criticism, take on board all the negative comments you get about your work and use them to improve it. I suppose it's fine if you're a brilliant writer. Brilliant writers can refuse to alter their artistic vision in any way. But if, like me, you're far from being brilliant, then you need help and advice from anyone who can be bothered to give it. Not all advice is helpful, though. People often instruct young comics, write about what makes you laugh. But you won't sell many scripts if the only one to find them funny is you. Speaker 4 Doing any kind of writing is lonely, and comedy is no different. Finding a writing partner is great. My best days are spent sitting in a room with someone else and trying to make each other laugh. You might then have to go off and work stuff up on your own, but at least you know one person has found your jokes funny. Oh, and move around a lot. It does wonders for your concentration. I've solved many problems walking to and from the fridge in search of a snack. Pausing to do a household chore, like washing up, works for other people. Speaker 5 The best advice I was ever given was to immerse myself in the kind of scripts that really made me laugh, and to analyse how it worked. Now, I'm not telling you to copy it, but I am saying you should use it as inspiration. Then send an example of your best material to the creators of shows you admire. Tell them what you admire about their work, and just keep on writing whatever happens. At first you might think you're mostly producing rubbish, but gradually there'll be less rubbish and more gold, so don't give up. That's the end of part three. Now turn to part four. You'll hear an interview with a woman called Maya Gardy, whose daily life and business are based on waste-free principles. For questions 24 to 30, choose the best answer. A, B, or C. You now have one minute to look at part four. My guest this week, Maya Gardi, has recently started her own company selling environmentally friendly products. First, let me ask you, Maya, what living waste-free involves on a daily basis? Well, when I'm shopping, I don't buy things in plastic packages. I take my own bags and containers, and I always buy fresh local food. I compost my food rubbish, and I recycle wherever I can. That kind of thing. When I started living like this, some things required a lot of adapting. My shopping habits were already pretty environmentally friendly, although I found I had to make more of an effort to go to lots of little shops where I could choose smaller amounts more often, rather than doing a single big supermarket shop every week, even though that was nice and convenient. Mm. 
So what made you first decide to live a completely waste-free lifestyle? Well, I've always been quite environmentally conscious, and I think this stems from the time I read an article on the internet about all the plastic waste in our oceans. I'd pass the rubbish bins outside my block of flats and feel quite pleased that at least I wasn't throwing away as much as other people. But a few years ago, I took some stuff to my local rubbish tip to throw away, things I couldn't recycle. I was horrified at the amount of waste there. That was all it took to make me change. What did your family think about your decision? Well, I live in a small flat on my own, so it wasn't as if I was imposing my lifestyle on my parents. They knew I was concerned about the environment, of course, but they still thought I was joking at first. They know how determined I am when I put my mind to something, though, and they knew that I'd be glad I'd done it. So, have you changed the way you prepare meals? Well, I've never been what you'd call an expert cook, as my friends will confirm. But I'm constantly dreaming up new ways of using up bits and pieces in the fridge. I often pass on these recipes to my friends, and they're always grateful for ways to save money. <laughs> Does your new lifestyle make things difficult for you when you're socialising? Yes. <laughs> when I go to picnics and barbecues, for example, the plates and cutlery tend to be disposable plastic, but I have to be proactive and not be concerned that I might come across as strange. So I would take along a proper plate, or if I couldn't do that, I'd eat from a paper napkin and then make sure it was composted rather than thrown away. Hmm. As you said, you've started a new business selling environmentally friendly products. Is it going well? Yes. I'm selling homemade products like toothpaste and deodorant, things that are made from simple, natural ingredients. They're all sold in containers that can be recycled or returned to me. I also have an internet blog which is helping enormously with publicising my products, it gives me an edge over my competitors, and I've got a few regulars I see at local events like fairs and outdoor markets. As for the future, let's see how this year goes first. <laughs> I hear you were also interviewed on the radio. Yes, it was at one fair I attended. I just happened to be in the right place at the right time when a reporter approached me. I didn't have time to get anxious. What was great was that it meant I could get my ideas across to a wider audience. Huh. Thank you for your time, Maya, and best of luck for the future. Now you'll hear part four again. My guest this week, Maya Gardi, has recently started her own company selling environmentally friendly products. First, let me ask you, Maya, what living waste-free involves on a daily basis? Well, when I'm shopping, I don't buy things in plastic packages. I take my own bags and containers, and I always buy fresh local food. I compost my food rubbish, and I recycle wherever I can. That kind of thing. When I started living like this, some things required a lot of adapting. My shopping habits were already pretty environmentally friendly, although I found I had to make more of an effort to go to lots of little shops where I could choose smaller amounts more often, rather than doing a single big supermarket shop every week, even though that was nice and convenient. Mm. So what made you first decide to live a completely waste-free lifestyle? Well, I've always been quite environmentally conscious, and I think this stems from the time I read an article on the internet about all the plastic waste in our oceans. I'd pass the rubbish bins outside my block of flats and feel quite pleased that at least I wasn't throwing away as much as other people. But a few years ago, I took some stuff to my local rubbish tip to throw away, things I couldn't recycle. I was horrified at the amount of waste there. That was all it took to make me change. What did your family think about your decision? Well, I live in a small flat on my own, so it wasn't as if I was imposing my lifestyle on my parents. They knew I was concerned about the environment, of course, but they still thought I was joking at first. They know how determined I am when I put my mind to something, though, and they knew that I'd be glad I'd done it. <laughs> so, have you changed the way you prepare meals? Well, I've never been what you'd call an expert cook, as my friends will confirm. But I'm constantly dreaming up new ways of using up bits and pieces in the fridge. 
I often pass on these recipes to my friends, and they're always grateful for ways to save money. <laughs> Does your new lifestyle make things difficult for you when you're socialising? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> when I go to picnics and barbecues, for example, the plates and cutlery tend to be disposable plastic. But I have to be proactive and not be concerned that I might come across as strange. So I would take along a proper plate, or if I couldn't do that, I'd eat from a paper napkin and then make sure it was composted rather than thrown away. Hmm. As you said, you've started a new business selling environmentally friendly products. Is it going well? Yes. I'm selling homemade products like toothpaste and deodorant, things that are made from simple, natural ingredients. They're all sold in containers that can be recycled or returned to me. I also have an internet blog which is helping enormously with publicising my products, gives me an edge over my competitors, and I've got a few regulars I see at local events like fairs and outdoor markets. As for the future, let's see how this year goes first. I hear you were also interviewed on the radio. Yes, it was at one fair I attended. I just happened to be in the right place at the right time when a reporter approached me. I didn't have time to get anxious. What was great was that it meant I could get my ideas across to a wider audience. Huh. Thank you for your time, Maya, and best of luck for the future. That's the end of part four. That's the end of the test. Cambridge English, first three. Now open your question paper and look at part one. You'll hear people talking in eight different situations. For questions one to eight, choose the best answer. A, B or C. Question 1. You hear a young woman, who is an apprentice cook, talking about her apprenticeship. I did well at school, but wasn't sure what to do next, to carry on studying or get a job straight away. Then I discovered the apprenticeship scheme, and now I'm in college for part of the week, studying professional cookery, and an apprentice working in local restaurants, including a four-star one, for the rest of it. The restaurant work is exhausting, and because I'm never in the same kitchen two days running, it's hard to settle into a routine. But the experience is invaluable, and it's paving the way to realising my dream of opening my own restaurant. And I've learnt so many different cooking techniques from my teacher at college. I did well at school, but wasn't sure what to do next to carry on studying or get a job straight away. Then I discovered the apprenticeship scheme, and now I'm in college for part of the week, studying professional cookery, and an apprentice working in local restaurants, including a four-star one, for the rest of it. The restaurant work is exhausting, and because I'm never in the same kitchen two days running, it's hard to settle into a routine. 
But the experience is invaluable, and it's paving the way to realising my dream of opening my own restaurant. And I've learnt so many different cooking techniques from my teacher at college. Question 2. You hear two students talking about passing the time on bus journeys. I seem to spend my life taking crowded buses all over town. It gets tedious and there's never a chance to sit down and do a quick bit of work. What about music? Haven't you got any earphones? Yeah, but I suspect if I did that, I'd completely lose track of time. Might miss my stop. Oh, right. Or the other thing for me is just looking out of the window at what's going on. You know, unwinding, even solving problems. I'll watch the world go by if I'm sitting in a window seat. But usually I'm jammed up against a metal pole, concentrating on not losing my bag. I seem to spend my life taking crowded buses all over town. It gets tedious and there's never a chance to sit down and do a quick bit of work. What about music? Haven't you got any earphones? Yeah, but I suspect if I did that, I'd completely lose track of time. Might miss my stop. Oh, right. Or the other thing for me is just looking out of the window at what's going on. You know, unwinding, even solving problems. I'll watch the world go by if I'm sitting in a window seat. But usually I'm jammed up against a metal pole, concentrating on not losing my bag. Question 3. You hear a cycle coach telling his group about the ride they are going to do. Right, listen really carefully, everyone. We're going to do the Moorland Hill route. Tony will lead us out of the car park. Please stay in a tight, compact group with no overtaking until we get out of town and over the bridge. Then we get onto the A69 main road. We'll be turning off at the second exit, not the first. Please note, because they're both signposted to Moorland Hill. I want you to try and push it up the big hill today, so save your legs and conserve some speed on the long, flat stretch past Aiken Village. On the return route, we'll have the wind behind us, so you can get some speed up later. Right, listen really carefully, everyone. We're going to do the Moorland Hill route. Tony will lead us out of the car park. Please stay in a tight, compact group with no overtaking until we get out of town and over the bridge. Then we get onto the A69 main road. We'll be turning off at the second exit, not the first. Please note, because they're both signposted to Moorland Hill. I want you to try and push it up the big hill today, so save your legs and conserve some speed on the long, flat stretch past Aiken Village. On the return route, we'll have the wind behind us, so you can get some speed up later. Question 4. You hear part of an interview in which a writer talks about autobiographies. Have you ever considered writing an autobiography? Well, certain sections of my novels are based on my experiences growing up. But as a reader, I've found autobiographies deeply unsatisfying and have no real enthusiasm for doing one. Some consist of chapter after chapter of mind-numbing trivial detail, or endless pages where the writer praises him or herself with little justification. Recently, in the autobiography of someone I've known personally since childhood, pure invention and no mention at all of several people who contributed significantly to his success. Have you ever considered writing an autobiography? Well, certain sections of my novels are based on my experiences growing up, but as a reader I've found autobiographies deeply unsatisfying and have no real enthusiasm for doing one. Some consist of chapter after chapter of mind-numbing trivial detail, or endless pages where the writer praises him or herself with little justification. Recently, in the autobiography of someone I've known personally since childhood, pure invention, and no mention at all of several people who contributed significantly to his success. Question 5. You hear a journalist telling a colleague about her time at university.
You're a biology graduate. What prompted you to take up journalism? You'd be amazed at how wide and varied it is, and how much it overlaps with other subjects like ecology, psychology, chemistry. And you could see this from the sort of jobs biology graduates were going into. I read all this on the university website. Some were even getting into jobs like banking. As for me, I got asked to report on one of my projects for the university student science magazine. Then that took off into a regular column, and so that sowed the seeds of a career. You're a biology graduate. What prompted you to take up journalism? You'd be amazed at how wide and varied it is, and how much it overlaps with other subjects like ecology, psychology, chemistry. And you could see this from the sort of jobs biology graduates were going into. I read all this on the university website. Some were even getting into jobs like banking. As for me, I got asked to report on one of my projects for the university student science magazine. Then that took off into a regular column, and so that sowed the seeds of a career. Question six: You hear a man and a woman talking about a new clothes shop they have visited. I went into that new clothes shop you were telling me about to have a look round. The one in Bridge Street. Yeah, you said you really liked the way they have a member of staff just inside the door to welcome you with a smile. That's right. Why didn't you like it? Well, I can't see the point of it. And shops soon lose interest in these experiments, which tells you something about the reaction of customers. Mind you, that's a step up on what happens in some clothes shops, where you get pushy sales staff asking if you need any help the moment you get near them. That I can't stand. I went into that new clothes shop you were telling me about to have a look round. The one in Bridge Street. Yeah, you said you really liked the way they have a member of staff just inside the door to welcome you with a smile. That's right. Why didn't you like it? Well, I can't see the point of it. And shops soon lose interest in these experiments, which tells you something about the reaction of customers. Mind you, that's a step up on what happens in some clothes shops, where you get pushy sales staff asking if you need any help the moment you get near them. That I can't stand. Question seven: You overhear a woman talking on the phone to a friend. Well, what's happening is I'm applying for lots of full-time posts, but meanwhile I've been networking on social media with a group of recent graduates based in my town. We're planning to buy a portable climbing wall, like the things you get now in some sports centres. Then we can take it to different places where there are lots of children, like beaches, country parks, that sort of thing. Some of the guys are trained mountaineers, so the safety qualifications are already in place. And I'd be the photographer taking action pictures of each climber to sell to the parents online. Shame it's only seasonal. Well, what's happening is I'm applying for lots of full-time posts, but meanwhile I've been networking on social media with a group of recent graduates based in my town. We're planning to buy a portable climbing wall, like the things you get now in some sports centres. Then we can take it to different places where there are lots of children, like beaches, country parks, that sort of thing. Some of the guys are trained mountaineers, so the safety qualifications are already in place. And I'd be the photographer taking action pictures of each climber to sell to the parents online. Shame it's only seasonal. Question eight: You hear part of a broadcast on the radio. A two-meter-tall penguin weighing in at 115 kilos. That's what researchers say the fossils of wing and foot bones recently unearthed in Antarctica belonged to. Such a bird would have been alive 37 million years ago. Given that the emperor penguin, the largest living species of penguin, stands 1.1 meters tall and weighs just under 50 kilos, it's no wonder that this newly discovered specimen is being called the Colossus. To find out more about this extraordinary bird. Including how its giant size allowed it to stay underwater for up to 40 minutes to hunt for fish.
Tune in tonight after the weather forecast. A two-meter tall penguin weighing in at 115 kilos, that's what researchers say the fossils of wing and foot bones recently unearthed in Antarctica belonged to. Such a bird would have been alive 37 million years ago. Given that the emperor penguin, the largest living species of penguin, stands 1.1 meters tall and weighs just under 50 kilos, it's no wonder that this newly discovered specimen is being called the Colossus. To find out more about this extraordinary bird, including how its giant size allowed it to stay underwater for up to 40 minutes to hunt for fish, tune in tonight after the weather forecast. That's the end of part one. Now turn to part two. You'll hear a woman called Paula Canning, who works as a film advisor in local government, talking about her work. For questions 9 to 18, complete the sentences with a word or short phrase. You now have 45 seconds to look at part 2. Hi, I'm Paula Canning. I work in my local council's film department. Let me explain what that is exactly. I live in a region that's featured in many films and TV programmes, and tourists are attracted there as a result. So, the local council decided to create a department with the job of promoting the region both to filmmakers and to tourists who'd seen the films. I joined the department when it was first set up. I now work as a film advisor, but when I started I was employed as what's called a location researcher. In other words, my job was to go round the region, trying to identify places that would be good for filming the outdoor sequences in films and TV programmes. What initially attracted me to the job wasn't so much the salary, although that was OK, but the fact that it involved flexible working hours, because I'd be travelling around the region looking for places I could fit the work around looking after my young family. One or two places in my region were already quite famous. For example, a big country house that once appeared in a TV drama series and a castle that's been used in a surprising number of horror films. My job, though, was to identify less obvious places that filmmakers wouldn't find without my help. For example, I worked a lot with a company that films advertisements. They'd come to me when they wanted to film a new car zooming up a mountain road or a field of cows for a cheese advert. I didn't always find what they were looking for, but I did suggest the beach in one ice cream advert that's been shown thousands of times in cinemas. I spent a year in that first job and really enjoyed it. It was fun working with the film industry and with local people too. Locals are generally thrilled to think their village or street might feature in a film. But I remember having to spend a lot of time trying to talk farmers into allowing filming on their land. Once I'd begun to build up a list of potential places... I decided to develop a database. This featured photos and a video clip as well as a written description of each place. I found developing all that material really rewarding and I think I did a really good job. I also made lots of useful contacts in the film industry and films are still being made in the region as a result. In my current job, I spend more time dealing with the tourism that films bring to the region I get involved in the planning of projects like special weekend tours that take visitors around the places they'll recognise from films. And I'm in charge of a project called Movie Map, which is an online resource for tourists who prefer to visit the places independently. I quite like the challenge of website design, but the tourist office also needs things to give out to tourists who aren't so keen on technology. So I also have to put together leaflets, which, believe it or not, is actually more complicated I don't know why, but dealing with printers seems to involve a lot of problems. Another thing I've been working on is a set of guidelines for tour companies which take groups of visitors to the sites, especially if it's places where people live. I think everyone understands the need to respect people's houses and land, you know, not to damage or drop litter, but people's privacy also needs to be respected. So there's lots going on in our department, and there's only three of us working in the office. That's why we've started what's known as a work placement programme, which is aimed at young people. It involves voluntary work, of course, 
But if we can get local teenagers in full-time education to come and work with us for a few weeks in the summer, it would help us and be great experience for them. So before I go on to the next section... Now you'll hear part two again. Hi, I'm Paula Canning. I work in my local council's film department. Let me explain what that is exactly. I live in a region that's featured in many films and TV programmes, and tourists are attracted there as a result. So, the local council decided to create a department with the job of promoting the region both to filmmakers and to tourists who'd seen the films. I joined the department when it was first set up, I now work as a film advisor, but when I started I was employed as what's called a location researcher. In other words, my job was to go round the region, trying to identify places that would be good for filming the outdoor sequences in films and TV programmes. What initially attracted me to the job wasn't so much the salary, although that was OK, but the fact that it involved flexible working hours, because I'd be travelling around the region looking for places I could fit the work around looking after my young family. One or two places in my region were already quite famous. For example, a big country house that once appeared in a TV drama series and a castle that's been used in a surprising number of horror films. My job, though, was to identify less obvious places that filmmakers wouldn't find without my help. For example, I worked a lot with a company that films advertisements. They'd come to me when they wanted to film a new car zooming up a mountain road or a field of cows for a cheese advert. I didn't always find what they were looking for, but I did suggest the beach in one ice cream advert that's been shown thousands of times in cinemas. I spent a year in that first job and really enjoyed it. It was fun working with the film industry and with local people too. Locals are generally thrilled to think their village or street might feature in a film. But I remember having to spend a lot of time trying to talk farmers into allowing filming on their land. Once I'd begun to build up a list of potential places... I decided to develop a database. This featured photos and a video clip as well as a written description of each place. I found developing all that material really rewarding and I think I did a really good job. I also made lots of useful contacts in the film industry and films are still being made in the region as a result. In my current job I spend more time dealing with the tourism that films bring to the region I get involved in the planning of projects like special weekend tours that take visitors around the places they'll recognise from films. And I'm in charge of a project called Movie Map, which is an online resource for tourists who prefer to visit the places independently. I quite like the challenge of website design, but the tourist office also needs things to give out to tourists who aren't so keen on technology. So I also have to put together leaflets, which, believe it or not, is actually more complicated I don't know why, but dealing with printers seems to involve a lot of problems. Another thing I've been working on is a set of guidelines for tour companies which take groups of visitors to the sites, especially if it's places where people live. I think everyone understands the need to respect people's houses and land, you know, not to damage or drop litter, but people's privacy also needs to be respected. So there's lots going on in our department, and there's only three of us working in the office. That's why we've started what's known as a work placement programme, which is aimed at young people. It involves voluntary work, of course, but if we can get local teenagers in full-time education to come and work with us for a few weeks in the summer, it would help us and be great experience for them. So before I go on to the next section... That's the end of part two. Now turn to part three. You'll hear five short extracts, in which people talk about why they didn't go to university directly after leaving school. For questions 19 to 23, choose which of the reasons, A to H, each speaker gives. Use the letters only once. There are three extra letters which you do not need to use. You now have 30 seconds to look at part three.
Speaker 1 At school, I always thought I'd wake up one day knowing exactly what I wanted to do with my life, but that never happened. I did like the idea of eventually going to university, but it felt like same again after 12 years of having my nose in books. When I was offered a job straight out of school, I took it without thinking. I changed jobs quite a bit before the penny finally dropped, and I realised that nursing was the career for me. I also felt that the time was right because I'd done a lot of growing up in the intervening years. So here I am at university at last. Speaker 2 Well, my wife and I got married really young, straight out of school. We just wanted to get on with being independent, I suppose, and getting on the first rung of the employment ladder was central to that. We both went out and got ourselves good positions, so financially we were secure. But after a few years I felt I wanted to change direction in terms of my work, and I realised that higher education was the only way. My wife and kids tried to persuade me to do something in computers so I could earn loads of money, but I chose to do politics instead. Speaker 3 When I didn't apply for a university place in my final year at school, people thought I wanted to take a year out for travelling. But I've wanted to be a vet for as long as I can remember, and I especially want to treat wild animals, and opportunities for studying that subject at university are few and far between. It actually took me ages to come up with one that exactly fitted the bill. Eventually, I got offered a place at a university in Europe starting next year. At least I've got time to earn a bit of money to take with me, and I can hardly wait to go. Speaker 4 My parents dropped a bombshell when I was in my final year at school. They calmly announced that we were emigrating to Australia, where I live now. Staying behind to go to university was never an option for me because Australia was a place I'd always fancied visiting. I think my parents just thought I'd be able to get straight into university in Australia. But the system's a bit different here, and it turned out I'd already missed the deadline. But I spent a great year travelling around Australia and enjoying the Australian way of life. I feel I've grown up now and become more responsible, and that I'll study harder because of my break. Speaker 5 I was all set to go off to university after I finished school and even had the application forms ready to fill in. Then my grandfather got taken ill and he needed help to get around. I decided to go and live with him because my mum was busy with a full-time job and we didn't really live nearby. So I spent six months doing that. I was completely broke, but I had plenty of free time and as he lives near the sea, I even took up surfing. It was great to experience something different. He's made a full recovery now, and I'm planning to go to university next year. Now you'll hear part three again. Speaker one. At school, I always thought I'd wake up one day knowing exactly what I wanted to do with my life, but that never happened. I did like the idea of eventually going to university, but it felt like same again after 12 years of having my nose in books. When I was offered a job straight out of school, I took it without thinking. I changed jobs quite a bit before the penny finally dropped, and I realised that nursing was the career for me. I also felt that the time was right because I'd done a lot of growing up in the intervening years. So here I am at university at last. Speaker 2 Well, my wife and I got married really young, straight out of school. We just wanted to get on with being independent, I suppose, and getting on the first rung of the employment ladder was central to that. We both went out and got ourselves good positions, so financially we were secure. But after a few years I felt I wanted to change direction in terms of my work, and I realised that higher education was the only way. My wife and kids tried to persuade me to do something in computers so I could earn loads of money, but I chose to do politics instead. Speaker 3 When I didn't apply for a university place in my final year at school, people thought I wanted to take a year out for travelling. But I've wanted to be a vet for as long as I can remember, 
and I specially want to treat wild animals, and opportunities for studying that subject at university are few and far between. It actually took me ages to come up with one that exactly fitted the bill. Eventually, I got offered a place at a university in Europe starting next year. At least I've got time to earn a bit of money to take with me, and I can hardly wait to go. Speaker 4 My parents dropped a bombshell when I was in my final year at school. They calmly announced that we were emigrating to Australia, where I live now. Staying behind to go to university was never an option for me because Australia was a place I'd always fancied visiting. I think my parents just thought I'd be able to get straight into university in Australia. But the system's a bit different here, and it turned out I'd already missed the deadline. But I spent a great year travelling around Australia and enjoying the Australian way of life. I feel I've grown up now and become more responsible, and that I'll study harder because of my break. Speaker 5 I was all set to go off to university after I finished school, and even had the application forms ready to fill in. Then my grandfather got taken ill, and he needed help to get around. I decided to go and live with him, because my mum was busy with a full-time job and we didn't really live nearby. So I spent six months doing that. I was completely broke, but I had plenty of free time, and as he lives near the sea, I even took up surfing. It was great to experience something different. He's made a full recovery now, and I'm planning to go to university next year. That's the end of part three. Now turn to part four. You'll hear a radio interview with a woman called Susan Fletcher who works on a research station in Antarctica. For questions 24 to 30, choose the best answer. A, B, or C. You now have one minute to look at part four. Susan Fletcher works as an environmental biologist on a research station in Antarctica. Between trips, she's joined us in the studio today to talk about what it's like working in one of the remotest places on Earth. Hi, everyone. First of all, you spend long periods of time in Antarctica, sometimes over a year, without coming home. How do you usually feel just before you set off? In the days leading up to it, I feel sad, of course. Everyone finds it hard to leave family behind. But I also feel grateful for having a chance to be away, and I really appreciate what they mean to me. These emotions are all part of preparing, but at the same time, I have to control my feelings of doubt about managing the challenges I know are coming my way. You're about to leave on another trip, aren't you? Are you under a lot of pressure? <laughs> yes, we all are. Scientists involved in polar research don't get a choice where they work, and it could be on land or at sea. To be fair, we have plenty of time to get everything ready and make sure we think of everything we'll need, both for the research and for ourselves personally. No matter how well organised a person is, though, there's always the danger of missing something that turns out to be vital, and that worries always somewhere at the back of my mind. And what are your colleagues like? They're an amazing bunch of people who put the interests of science and research before their own needs for months on end. Antarctica is one of the most difficult places to live on the planet, and somehow they make life there tolerable. Everyone's responsible for everyone else and for ensuring that we achieve our objectives. I suppose you have to provide your own entertainment. <laughs> yes, indeed. Especially music evenings, or evenings when people cook food from a particular country. Although there's no shortage of enthusiasm, it has to be said that our talents lie in other fields. <laughs> it's actually crucial for our well-being to have special events, because otherwise the days just combine to become one endless day or night. In the Antarctic summer, for example, the sun rises in September and doesn't set again until March. Mm. Is there anything you find difficult about life on a research station? Well, it's comfortable, but it really is communal living, so you have to get used to that. We have our own bedrooms, but so much of our day is spent in other people's company, and I sometimes find that tough. 
By the time I get to bed at night, I'm so tired I just fall asleep immediately and sleep pretty soundly. The food's all right. You can choose what to have, and there's a reasonable variety. You obviously love your work. Can you say what it is about it that makes you want to keep on going back? Hmm. I mean, I'm so incredibly lucky to be able to work in such an unusual environment. I walk past penguins every day without even thinking about it. That remote and inhospitable continent miles from anywhere has come to be a second home for me, which is a real privilege. What advice would you give to students hoping to work on a research station in Antarctica in the future? Well, there are scientists there with degrees in a wide variety of subjects, from engineering to biology. And there's also a doctor, a chef, pilots, computer specialists, and people from many different walks of life. So look on the website and see what's going on. That will give you an idea of the qualifications and experience you'll need if you want to join us. You must be determined because you'll need to become an expert in your chosen field. But if that's your dream, then go for it. Well, thanks, Susan, for telling us about your work. Now you'll hear part four again. Susan Fletcher works as an environmental biologist on a research station in Antarctica. Between trips, she's joined us in the studio today to talk about what it's like working in one of the remotest places on Earth. Hi, everyone. First of all, you spend long periods of time in Antarctica, sometimes over a year, without coming home. How do you usually feel just before you set off? In the days leading up to it, I feel sad, of course. Everyone finds it hard to leave family behind. But I also feel grateful for having a chance to be away, and I really appreciate what they mean to me. These emotions are all part of preparing, but at the same time, I have to control my feelings of doubt about managing the challenges I know are coming my way. You're about to leave on another trip, aren't you? Are you under a lot of pressure? <laughs> yes, we all are. Scientists involved in polar research don't get a choice where they work, and it could be on land or at sea. To be fair, we have plenty of time to get everything ready and make sure we think of everything we'll need, both for the research and for ourselves personally. No matter how well organised a person is, though, there's always the danger of missing something that turns out to be vital, and that worries always somewhere at the back of my mind. And what are your colleagues like? They're an amazing bunch of people who put the interests of science and research before their own needs for months on end. Antarctica is one of the most difficult places to live on the planet, and somehow they make life there tolerable. Everyone's responsible for everyone else, and for ensuring that we achieve our objectives. I suppose you have to provide your own entertainment. <laughs> yes, indeed. Especially music evenings, or evenings when people cook food from a particular country. Although there's no shortage of enthusiasm, it has to be said that our talents lie in other fields. <laughs> it's actually crucial for our well-being to have special events, because otherwise the days just combine to become one endless day or night. In the Antarctic summer, for example, the sun rises in September and doesn't set again until March. Mm. Is there anything you find difficult about life on a research station? Well, it's comfortable, but it really is communal living, so you have to get used to that. We have our own bedrooms, but so much of our day is spent in other people's company, and I sometimes find that tough. By the time I get to bed at night, I'm so tired I just fall asleep immediately and sleep pretty soundly. The food's all right. You can choose what to have, and there's a reasonable variety. You obviously love your work. Can you say what it is about it that makes you want to keep on going back? Hmm. I mean, I'm so incredibly lucky to be able to work in such an unusual environment. I walk past penguins every day without even thinking about it. That remote and inhospitable continent miles from anywhere has come to be a second home for me, which is a real privilege. What advice would you give to students hoping to work on a research station in Antarctica in the future? Well, there are scientists there with degrees in a wide variety of subjects, from engineering to biology. And there's also a doctor, a chef, pilots, computer specialists, and people from many different walks of life. So look on the website and see what's going on. That will give you an idea of the qualifications and experience you'll need if you want to join us. You must be determined because you'll need to become an expert in your chosen field. But if that's your dream, then go for it. Well, thanks, Susan, for telling us about your work. I don't... That's the end of part four.
Cambridge English, first three. Now open your question paper and look at part one. You'll hear people talking in eight different situations. For questions one to eight, choose the best answer. A, B, or C. Question one. You hear a man talking about an ancient object he found in the ground. It sounds silly, I know, but I'd never seen anything like that before, and I just thought it was the lid of a coffee pot or something. It was disc-shaped and decorated with a snake's head on top. I was curious as I couldn't identify it, so I went along to show it to the historian in the museum in town. She looked at it and went very quiet. It was at that point I realised that I'd found something really special. She entered it into a register of local historical finds and then sent it off to the National Museum, and it's still there now, in an exhibition. It sounds silly, I know, but I'd never seen anything like that before, and I just thought it was the lid of a coffee pot or something. It was disc-shaped and decorated with a snake's head on top. I was curious as I couldn't identify it, so I went along to show it to the historian in the museum in town. She looked at it and went very quiet. It was at that point I realised that I'd found something really special. She entered it into a register of local historical finds and then sent it off to the National Museum, and it's still there now, in an exhibition. Question 2. You hear two friends talking about advertising. Have you seen that new mobile phone ad? Oh yeah, it's everywhere. It's quite fun, though I can't say I feel that way about most advertisements. Some of them are very clever though, aren't they? Yes, when it comes to persuading people, they can't live without stuff that's actually completely useless. <laughs> or at least they usually already have something just as good, so why replace it? But it's interesting to know what's out there, isn't it? Well, I'd say there are better ways of finding out about whether new products are any good than believing an ad that's cost millions to make. Yeah, maybe. But they don't do any harm, really. Have you seen that new mobile phone ad? Oh, yeah, it's everywhere. It's quite fun, though I can't say I feel that way about most advertisements. Some of them are very clever, though, aren't they? Yes, when it comes to persuading people, they can't live without stuff that's actually completely useless. <laughs> or at least they usually already have something just as good, so why replace it? But it's interesting to know what's out there, isn't it? Well, I'd say there are better ways of finding out about whether new products are any good than believing an ad that's cost millions to make. Yeah, maybe. But they don't do any harm, really. Question 3. You hear an actor talking about her career. I went for an audition to get into drama school because I'd always wanted to be an actor. Anyway, they turned me down, which was a major obstacle. While I was trying to decide what to do next with my life, I went out for a meal with an old friend of mine who's a successful actor to ask her for some advice. So we were sitting in this restaurant chatting away when a film director came up to say hello. My friend had worked with him on a film and introduced me. A few days later, the director just phoned up and offered me a role in his next film. I went for an audition to get into drama school because I'd always wanted to be an actor. Anyway, they turned me down, which was a major obstacle. While I was trying to decide what to do next with my life, I went out for a meal with an old friend of mine who's a successful actor to ask her for some advice. So we were sitting in this restaurant chatting away when a film director came up to say hello. My friend had worked with him on a film and introduced me. A few days later, the director just phoned up and offered me a role in his next film. Question 4. You hear a tour guide telling a group of tourists about a view.
Let me just stop here to enable you to savour the spectacular view. So, over to your left, if you look down, you can see a little circular wood. Well, that's quite a famous landmark locally, because the poet Francis Alder actually used to have a cabin in that wood. Now, down in the valley below there, you can make out the River Thorn at its widest point, which Alder actually wrote about in many of his poems we all read when we were at school. Then, if you look to halfway up the hill, I'm sure you can see a large green area known as Callaway Park that's popular with young families. Let me just stop here to enable you to savour the spectacular view. So, over to your left, if you look down, you can see a little circular wood. Well, that's quite a famous landmark locally, because the poet Francis Alder actually used to have a cabin in that wood. Now, down in the valley below there, you can make out the River Thorn at its widest point, which Alder actually wrote about in many of his poems we all read when we were at school. Then, if you look to halfway up the hill, I'm sure you can see a large green area known as Callaway Park that's popular with young families. Question 5. You hear a man talking to a friend about a presentation he has just given. So, how did your presentation go? Pretty well, I think. And judging by the number of people there, I'd pick the right topic. It's an area of law that's very relevant at the moment, and that was reflected in the size of the audience, so I needn't have worried on that score. All that practising in front of the mirror paid off, as did all that work I did recording myself and making sure I could easily be heard at the back of the room. I was quite well prepared for the questions, though of course there were a couple I hadn't expected. There always are. So how did your presentation go? Pretty well, I think, and judging by the number of people there, I'd pick the right topic. It's an area of law that's very relevant at the moment, and that was reflected in the size of the audience, so I needn't have worried on that score. All that practising in front of the mirror paid off, as did all that work I did recording myself and making sure I could easily be heard at the back of the room. I was quite well prepared for the questions, though of course there were a couple I hadn't expected. There always are. Question 6. You hear two students talking about a careers talk they have just heard at college. That was a good careers talk, wasn't it? Well, yes and no. I mean, the speaker knew his stuff, but not much of it was new. We've already had two careers talks this year, covering most of the same topics. Mm, you have a point there. But he made some great jokes and held everyone's attention. There was no chatting in the back row or people checking their phones every five minutes. Actually, there was quite a lot of that. I think you just didn't notice. I did think he was funny, though. That was a good careers talk, wasn't it? Well, yes and no. I mean, the speaker knew his stuff, but not much of it was new. We've already had two careers talks this year, covering most of the same topics. Mm, you have a point there. But he made some great jokes and held everyone's attention. There was no chatting in the back row or people checking their phones every five minutes. Actually, there was quite a lot of that. I think you just didn't notice. I did think he was funny, though. Question 7. You hear an author of children's books talking about her work. When I start writing a novel for children, my main aim is not to write a successful book. I write about things that I used to love reading about when I was their age. I've been writing novels for children for some years now, and I've come to realize that mystery is important, but what the children really want to read about is the young characters in the book. By solving a mystery, the characters have to build their relationships and solve problems together. So many writers try to teach children things too directly, but doing that just turns children off. When I start writing a novel for children, my main aim is not to write a successful book. I write about things that I used to love reading about when I was their age. 
I've been writing novels for children for some years now, and I've come to realize that mystery is important, but what the children really want to read about is the young characters in the book. By solving a mystery, the characters have to build their relationships and solve problems together. So many writers try to teach children things too directly, but doing that just turns children off. Question 8. You hear a man and a woman talking about older people learning languages. How are your mum's Spanish classes going? Oh, I'm not sure. She thinks she's too old to be doing them. The younger students learn so much quicker than her. Younger students do pick things up more quickly in terms of accent and so on, but I think older people have an advantage. They've learned to be efficient in how they spend their time, and they've also learned how to study. I bet your mum's grammar and vocabulary are better than the younger students. Anyway, there are so many apps and programs out there for learning languages, so people of any age can practice their skills whenever they want, even on the way to work. How are your mum's Spanish classes going? Oh, I'm not sure. She thinks she's too old to be doing them. The younger students learn so much quicker than her. Younger students do pick things up more quickly in terms of accent and so on, but I think older people have an advantage. They've learned to be efficient in how they spend their time, and they've also learned how to study. I bet your mum's grammar and vocabulary are better than the younger students. Anyway, there are so many apps and programs out there for learning languages, so people of any age can practice their skills whenever they want, even on the way to work. That's the end of part one. Now turn to part two. You'll hear a student called Andy Richards talking about his recent trip to the tea-growing region of Assam in northern India. For questions 9 to 18, complete the sentences with a word or short phrase. You now have 45 seconds to look at part 2. Hello, I'm Andy Richards, and I'm here to talk about my recent trip to a tea plantation in the northeast of India, where Assam tea is grown. My trip to the tea plantation was for my first year university project. If you're not a business studies student, you might wonder why I chose that destination. After all, you'd think it would better suit natural sciences or geography students. But luckily, I found lots that related to my course and my project. On the first morning of the visit, we were given a talk by the plantation manager about how the tea's grown. I discovered that the region where it's grown is really hot and experiences high rainfall. The humidity traps the heat in and provides perfect growing conditions, a kind of natural greenhouse, if you like. It certainly felt like one anyway. After the talk, we were invited to a tea tasting session. We went along the veranda of the plantation house and into the dining room. On the other side was a separate room called the gallery, and this was where the tea tasting took place. Awaiting us was a range of 57 different types of tea blends from around the world. Then we went on a tour of the plantation and saw the tea pickers, who were mainly women. They were amazingly fast and skillful. They used their thumbs and forefingers to pick the buds and leaves from the stem of the tea plant. I was surprised because I thought only the leaves would get picked. I got to ask a lot of questions about the commercial aspects of the plantation for my project. To finish off a fantastic first day, a special afternoon tea, complete with elephant ride, had been organised. I had a fantastic view from the elephant's back, and I was amazed that I was able to catch a glimpse of the mountains on the horizon. We wandered along the roads and through the local villages, watching the local people going about their daily lives. Eventually we arrived at a neighbouring tea garden where refreshments were waiting for us. We had sandwiches that literally melted in your mouth. Why don't they taste like that at home? We also tried some curry puffs and some cream cakes, a speciality of the area apparently. And there was tea too, obviously. After a while the sun began to go down and we could choose how to get back to the plantation. 
Some chose to walk or go by elephant. I decided to ride a vintage motorbike back, which meant driving through the villages on a muddy track. I was OK until I tried to cross a stream. The tyres slipped on the stones, but luckily I only got my feet wet. We were lucky that our two-day visit coincided with the Saturday market in the nearest village. I was surprised at how big it was, and I spent several hours wandering down the narrow aisles between the stalls, looking at the jewellery, the colourful saris, and, believe it or not, the winter jackets. That was rather puzzling, considering the weather. I had a go at bargaining for the best price for some presents. I was a bit embarrassed to begin with. I started off buying a bag for my older sister. I probably paid too much, to be honest, but later I bought a nose ring for my other sister. And by then, I'd really got into it. I think I got a real bargain there. Everything was larger than life in that market, especially the food. Nothing like shopping in a supermarket back home. The red peppers looked as if they'd been polished. The colourful spices were overflowing out of large sacks, and the carrots were bright red too, twice the size I'm used to, so I actually bought some of those. Tasted amazing. Now, let me move on to the lavish dinner they prepared. Now you'll hear part two again. Hello, I'm Andy Richards, and I'm here to talk about my recent trip to a tea plantation in the northeast of India, where Assam tea is grown. My trip to the tea plantation was for my first year university project. If you're not a business studies student, you might wonder why I chose that destination. After all, you'd think it would better suit natural sciences or geography students. But luckily, I found lots that related to my course and my project. On the first morning of the visit, we were given a talk by the plantation manager about how the tea's grown. I discovered that the region where it's grown is really hot and experiences high rainfall. The humidity traps the heat in and provides perfect growing conditions, a kind of natural greenhouse, if you like. It certainly felt like one, anyway. After the talk, we were invited to a tea tasting session. We went along the veranda of the plantation house and into the dining room. On the other side was a separate room called the gallery, and this was where the tea tasting took place. Awaiting us was a range of 57 different types of tea blends from around the world. Then we went on a tour of the plantation and saw the tea pickers, who were mainly women. They were amazingly fast and skillful. They used their thumbs and forefingers to pick the buds and leaves from the stem of the tea plant. I was surprised because I thought only the leaves would get picked. I got to ask a lot of questions about the commercial aspects of the plantation for my project. To finish off a fantastic first day, a special afternoon tea, complete with elephant ride, had been organised. I had a fantastic view from the elephant's back, and I was amazed that I was able to catch a glimpse of the mountains on the horizon. We wandered along the roads and through the local villages, watching the local people going about their daily lives. Eventually we arrived at a neighbouring tea garden, where refreshments were waiting for us. We had sandwiches that literally melted in your mouth. Why don't they taste like that at home? We also tried some curry puffs and some cream cakes, a speciality of the area, apparently. And there was tea, too, obviously. After a while, the sun began to go down and we could choose how to get back to the plantation. Some chose to walk or go by elephant. I decided to ride a vintage motorbike back, which meant driving through the villages on a muddy track. I was OK until I tried to cross a stream. The tyres slipped on the stones, but luckily I only got my feet wet. We were lucky that our two-day visit coincided with the Saturday market in the nearest village. I was surprised at how big it was, and I spent several hours wandering down the narrow aisles between the stalls, looking at the jewellery, the colourful saris, and, believe it or not, the winter jackets. That was rather puzzling, considering the weather. I had a go at bargaining for the best price for some presents. I was a bit embarrassed to begin with. I started off buying a bag for my older sister. I probably paid too much, to be honest, but later I bought a nose ring for my other sister. And by then, I'd really got into it. I think I got a real bargain there. 
Everything was larger than life in that market, especially the food. Nothing like shopping in a supermarket back home. The red peppers looked as if they'd been polished. The colourful spices were overflowing out of large sacks, and the carrots were bright red too, twice the size I'm used to, so I actually bought some of those. Tasted amazing. Now, let me move on to the lavish dinner they prepared. That's the end of part two. Now turn to part three. You'll hear five short extracts in which people are talking about work they did in shops. For questions 19 to 23, choose from the options A to H what each person says about their experience. Use the letters only once. There are three extra letters which you do not need to use. You now have 30 seconds to look at part three. Speaker one. I spent six months as a sales assistant in a toy shop. Until you've actually done it, you don't realise how hard it is working in a shop. They say the customers are always right, but let me tell you, they're not. Sometimes they're simply rude. When I'd had a particularly tough day for one reason or another, my fellow workers were always sympathetic, for which I was very grateful. But I was glad it was only a temporary job, even though I was quite good at it. One thing came as a result of that. I'm always nice to shop assistants now. Speaker 2 The shop where I worked sold mobile phones. There were six of us working there and there was never a moment when we weren't rushing about. It's draining being on your feet all day. Some of our customers hadn't a clue what they wanted, and others seemed to have a lot more knowledge than me. You had to be ready for a huge variety of questions. At the end of my shift, my brain couldn't cope with any more. In the evenings, I just sat at home watching rubbish on the TV. I work in a flower shop now. Much more my thing. Speaker 3 I sold jeans in a really fashionable shop. We worked on commission, which made selling quite competitive, so the more I sold, the bigger my take-home pay was. Even knowing that, I couldn't make myself push a pair of jeans on a customer if I thought they looked awful on her. And I think the customers recognised my honesty because I had a lot coming back who chose to be served by me. It was quite satisfying knowing that my approach seemed to work. In the end, I probably sold just as many as my colleagues, if not more. Speaker 4 my colleagues were great, and I really enjoyed some aspects of selling. I mean, I knew I was a good sales assistant, even with difficult customers. I was working in a furniture shop, selling top-of-the-range sofas and chairs. In fact, we were also having to sell some stuff that wasn't top-of-the-range, and that wasn't reflected in the price. I tried to put people off buying these lower-quality pieces, as I didn't think they were worth the money. In the end, I left because of this, and I've moved out of selling. I miss it sometimes. Speaker 5 The dress shop I worked in always seemed to be having a sale where loads of things were marked down by as much as 50%. It attracted customers into the shop, but not much of the discounted stuff was sold. Customers preferred our latest models, which were full price, but I wasn't very good with customers. I'd had a couple of days before I started with the manager who went through the stock with me and the mysteries of the credit card machine but nothing on actually dealing with customers. So I left after a couple of months and tried something else instead. Now you'll hear part three again. Speaker one. I spent six months as a sales assistant in a toy shop. 
Until you've actually done it, you don't realise how hard it is working in a shop. They say the customers are always right, but let me tell you, they're not. Sometimes they're simply rude. When I'd had a particularly tough day for one reason or another, my fellow workers were always sympathetic, for which I was very grateful. But I was glad it was only a temporary job, even though I was quite good at it. One thing came as a result of that. I'm always nice to shop assistants now. Speaker 2 The shop where I worked sold mobile phones. There were six of us working there and there was never a moment when we weren't rushing about. It's draining being on your feet all day. Some of our customers hadn't a clue what they wanted, and others seemed to have a lot more knowledge than me. You had to be ready for a huge variety of questions. At the end of my shift, my brain couldn't cope with any more. In the evenings, I just sat at home watching rubbish on the TV. I work in a flower shop now. Much more my thing. Speaker 3 I sold jeans in a really fashionable shop. We worked on commission, which made selling quite competitive, so the more I sold, the bigger my take-home pay was. Even knowing that, I couldn't make myself push a pair of jeans on a customer if I thought they looked awful on her. And I think the customers recognised my honesty because I had a lot coming back who chose to be served by me. It was quite satisfying knowing that my approach seemed to work. In the end, I probably sold just as many as my colleagues, if not more. Speaker 4 My colleagues were great, and I really enjoyed some aspects of selling. I mean, I knew I was a good sales assistant, even with difficult customers. I was working in a furniture shop, selling top-of-the-range sofas and chairs. In fact, we were also having to sell some stuff that wasn't top-of-the-range and that wasn't reflected in the price. I tried to put people off buying these lower quality pieces as I didn't think they were worth the money. In the end, I left because of this, and I've moved out of selling. I miss it sometimes. Speaker 5 The dress shop I worked in always seemed to be having a sale where loads of things were marked down by as much as 50%. It attracted customers into the shop, but not much of the discounted stuff was sold. Customers preferred our latest models, which were full price, but I wasn't very good with customers. I'd had a couple of days before I started with the manager who went through the stock with me and the mysteries of the credit card machine, but nothing on actually dealing with customers. So I left after a couple of months and tried something else instead. That's the end of part three. Now turn to part four. You'll hear an interview with Marvin Benby, a beekeeper who keeps his bees in hives on a city rooftop. For questions 24 to 30, choose the best answer. A, B, or C. You now have one minute to look at part four. I'm talking to Marvin Benby, a city beekeeper. Marvin, how did you get into this? I'd always been interested in insects, and a friend in the countryside was always telling me how enjoyable he found beekeeping. He's got his own hives, you know, beehives which bees are kept in, and produces beautiful honey. But living in a city doing it myself hadn't occurred to me. Where would I keep them? I knew so little about it. Then I saw a newspaper ad for a beekeeping workshop and told my friend. But he just raised his eyebrows. That was it. I thought, you don't believe I can do it, and signed up for the course. Is keeping bees fun? Well, I've become somewhat obsessed with bees. As you probably know, they're essential for keeping plants growing. They help spread their seeds. You're doing a favour to society by keeping up bee numbers, providing homes for them. Of course, my friends love me because I'm always giving them pots of honey. You only open the hive for a good reason, as it's an intrusion breaking the seal on the hive. It's the highlight for me, and I can hardly sleep the night before, looking forward to seeing how they're doing. Is it difficult keeping bees in a city? 
Wherever you do it, you'll have to invest in things. Uh, a honey extractor, a bee smoker, special gear to protect yourself. The stuff's as easy to get in urban as in rural areas. It's devastating if a disease strikes the hive. You can't help but feel responsible, even if it's just nature taking its course. Actually, bees in rural areas suffer worse. Many say it's due to pesticides used on farm crops. In fact, city bees are fortunate enough to be exposed to a tremendous diversity of plants. There are things growing everywhere. Do your neighbours mind you keeping bees? I'm lucky to have some roof space where my beehives sit. My neighbours don't seem to mind. I wondered if there'd be complaints as some people worry about the fact bees can sting, but they only sting if they feel threatened. I originally kept the hives at street level, but then offered to move them up to the roof when I discovered the guy who lives on the ground floor is allergic to them. He mentioned the risks and it seemed wiser to relocate to the top of the building. Five short extracts in which people are talking about work they did in shops. For questions 19 to 23, Choose from the options A to H what each person says about their experience. Use the letters only once. There are three extra letters which you do not need to use. You now have 30 seconds to look at part three. Now you'll hear part four again. I'm talking to Marvin Benby, a city beekeeper. Marvin, how did you get into this? I'd always been interested in insects, and a friend in the countryside was always telling me how enjoyable he found beekeeping. He's got his own hives, you know, beehives which bees are kept in, and produces beautiful honey. But living in a city, doing it myself, hadn't occurred to me. Where would I keep them? I knew so little about it. Then I saw a newspaper ad for a beekeeping workshop and told my friend. But he just raised his eyebrows. That was it. I thought, you don't believe I can do it, and signed up for the course. Is keeping bees fun? Well, I've become somewhat obsessed with bees. As you probably know, they're essential for keeping plants growing. They help spread their seeds. You're doing a favour to society by keeping up bee numbers, providing homes for them. Of course, my friends love me because I'm always giving them pots of honey. You only open the hive for a good reason, as it's an intrusion breaking the seal on the hive. It's the highlight for me, and I can hardly sleep the night before, looking forward to seeing how they're doing. Is it difficult keeping bees in a city? Wherever you do it, you'll have to invest in things. Uh, a honey extractor, a bee smoker, special gear to protect yourself... The stuff's as easy to get in urban as in rural areas. It's devastating if a disease strikes the hive. You can't help but feel responsible, even if it's just nature taking its course. Actually, bees in rural areas suffer worse. Many say it's due to pesticides used on farm crops. In fact, city bees are fortunate enough to be exposed to a tremendous diversity of plants. There are things growing everywhere. Do your neighbours mind you keeping bees? I'm lucky to have some roof space where my beehives sit. My neighbours don't seem to mind. I wondered if there'd be complaints as some people worry about the fact bees can sting, but they only sting if they feel threatened. I originally kept the hives at street level, 
but then offered to move them up to the roof when I discovered the guy who lives on the ground floor is allergic to them. He mentioned the risks, and it seemed wiser to relocate to the top of the building. This is your fifth year of beekeeping. Yes, I'll never forget setting up my first hive. It involved moving my bees from a box into a new wooden hive. It's important they don't have any confusion about where the entrance to the new hive is. It must be in a familiar position or they get lost if they fly outside. I had to feed the bees sugar syrup so they'd be full and sleepy and wouldn't react badly. I'd forgotten to bring gloves and as I poured in the sugar syrup to make matters worse... I spilt some on my unprotected hand so they were sticky and bees started settling on them. I was terrified they'd turn agitated and aggressive, but it went smoothly. You now sell honey and candles made from beeswax. And other products. I had to put quite a bit of cash down for stuff I needed. But I'm determined to turn it into a profitable business and I've recruited some volunteers to help me sell things. I'm keen to involve the local community as much as possible. Hopefully more people will consider taking up beekeeping. Everyone loves honey after all. So what's next? My knowledge has reached a point where ideally I'd say I'm confident enough to sit back a bit more in the coming months, which is what an experienced beekeeper hopes to do when things are going well. There's little certainty though. The next season brings fear as well as hope and joy. If you lose bees, there's guilt. Did you do something wrong? The weather's definitely key too. How the bees manage it affects everything. That's the end of part four.